I'd like to introduce you to somebody. Um, someone who will listen to your every mood. Someone who knows how to fix everything that's wrong in your life and your house. Um, someone who cares very deeply about you. I'm going to show you their picture. Probably guessing it's you know, from Match.com, perhaps some prison database or some such. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'll show you. I'll show you a baby picture. Does anyone know um, what these are? Who these are? Maybe this is an awkward family photo, perhaps. Anyone? <laughs> these are, these are stem cells. Um, these are these are human embryonic stem cells. Um, every one of us at one point were one of these, right? Um, pretty incredible. And um, what is a stem cell? Anyone know? Um, we've heard a lot about them, right, in the news. Um, stem cells are really cool. They're these little itty-bitty um, pieces, building blocks of life, right? And uh, what makes a stem cell a stem cell is that they have this kind of dual ability, um, this ability to either self-renew, so become, divide and become more and more stem cells, or they can differentiate and become any one of the 200 types of cells or more inside our bodies. This, they've got a, a really big repertoire. Okay, so these are, these are embryonic stem cells. And um, this is a beautiful example. These are um, neurons derived from embryonic stem cells. And as you can see, they're quite beautiful and um, you know, quite specialized looking. And I, just as an aside, I mean, um, has anyone if anyone's seen lots of portraits of cells, um, you, you, start to, you start to realize that beyond just being data for us scientists in the lab, they're actually quite beautiful images. So just to, just to appreciate those for a second. Um, but you know, in a way, I, I did a, build, a bit of a bait and switch because um, <laughs> we, uh, those, those embryonic stem cells that I showed at the, at the beginning, those, the little baby picture, that's not exactly like who that would be in our bodies. Um, so so he, um, stem cells can actually be, be divided into about two broad categories. The first being um, what I just showed, embryonic stem cells. So those are stem cells that are derived from um, uh, embryos that were created or uh, discarded during um, in vitro fertilization processes. And, um, but what we have in our bodies that regenerate our um, or regenerate and renew our bodies every day are adult stem cells. And you're like, what's the difference? And actually, um, from a stem cell's perspective, um, even infants are, are adults because, um, well, you stop being embryonic like right after those first couple divisions. But anyhow, um, so embryonic stem cells can become any type of cell in the body, but adult stem cells have a more limited repertoire. They can self-renew and they can divide and become more and more stem cells, but they can't necessarily become any cell in the body. So um, you might have hematopoietic stem cells that can just become um, different kinds of types of cells in the blood, or you have um, stem cells in your fat. We'll get to that. You're like, stem cells in your fat? Really? Um, and those can become um, cartilage, bone, or not surprisingly, fat. Um, but anyhow. So there's this idea of pluripotent, so these cells can become anything, or from the adult stem cell perspective, just multipotent, okay? All right, so some examples, um, animals that would have um, otherwise be destined for fur coats, and people who are bald would be really excited to know about stem cells in your hair follicles, right? Oh, aren't these beautiful? I mean, this could almost be a Jackson Pollock. Um, these are stem cells from the fat, right? So lots of people can now feel altruistic about their liposuction. Um, we have um, stem cells in our hippocampus, right? Does everyone know what that is? Hint, hint, elephants have a really big one. Um, it's the part of our brain that um, makes memories. And we have stem cells in our hippocampus. That is so cool. Um, and there's lots of really great research that is um, studying the effect of stress and sleep on our ability to create these stem cells in our brain, but also the ability of those stem cells to become real memory forming cells. So lots of food for thought there, no pun intended. And um, these cells are so active and so amazing. And this is like a really cool picture of a stem cell that's emerging from bone. Um, I, just, I just really love these images. Um, so we've got like, you know, we can go on a whole stem cell safari throughout the body and really look at all these amazing, um, cap, you know, 
images of, of these cells in action. And these are all within every one of us. Billions of cells inside our bodies conspiring to keep us alive, usually in spite of us, every day. Um, in the lab, what can we do with these cells? Um, we can do some interesting things because, not surprisingly, there's a nature versus nurture kind of thing that happens in the body as well. So these are stem cells that are derived from, um, from inside the mouth, so dental stem cells. And these can actually, in the lab, if exposed to certain factors, can become muscle cells. You're like, what? That's crazy, right? Um, and stem <laughs> there are lots of really interesting stem cell sources in your, you know, I could gross you out with some of them. Um, but this one, um, I'm choosing not to talk about endometrial-derived stem cells today. Um, but stem cells derived from cord blood, this is another really interesting source that's happening right now. Um, a lot of people who know people who've had babies in the recent past. So these are actually adult stem cells. They're from the human umbilical cord. And they're really cool because um, they're a lot like the um, bone marrow derived stem cells. And so have implications for potential treatments for leukemia going forward. So you're like, wow, these are really cool. Now, there are some other interesting sources of stem cells that are um, surprising as well. Um, this is a case of stem cells in, within a cancerous tumor. And what's a really cool technology, so for those of you who are probably aware, there are lots and lots of stem cell controversies, um, specifically around human embryonic stem cells, because whether or not you believe in in vitro fertilization aside, um, there's, you know, there's just... It, there's real interest in, in trying to derive stem cells without ever having to um, use cells that were ever even remotely associated with an embryo. Although that's a philosophical question, given that we've all come from stem cells ourselves. And well, it's, anyway, over dinner, over drinks. Um, but what's really cool is that you can transfect cells from like the skin, like cells that are terminally differentiated with just a couple of genes and actually trick those cells into kind of going back into an embryonic state. And our um, colleagues in, in um, Ireland would say, you know, hit them over the head with a stick and make them forget what their real like purpose in life was and they can become a stem cell. And, and from those stem cells you can actually get them to generate every tissue in the body all over again, which is really cool. Um, now imagine what you could do if, okay, what if, um, you take these stem cells from a skin, you take a, a skin sample, right, apply those four genes, get those stem cells to go back in, get those cells to go back into an embryonic state, and then grow, in this case, neurons from that. Our colleague, um, Kevin Egan, did such a thing with skin cells from patients who have ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, and so took skin cells tricked them into becoming embryonic cells, and then grew neurons from them. And those neurons became a great model of disease to be able to study ALS in the lab. Okay, so patient-specific disease models, okay? And you're, I haven't even told you a thing about myself, right? So you're like, who is this chick? Why is she talking about this stuff? So, um, oh wait, <gasps> I'll get to that in a second. Just one more example. Um, retinitis pigmentosa runs in my family. It's something I'm really, really deeply interested in, and this is a patient-specific line. Um, of, of, I believe these are cone cells, no, these are rod cells, so, so light-sensing cells um, derived from IP, these are IPS cells, so um, induced pluripotent stem cells, so this kind of like fake embryonic stem cell. And you can get them to grow, and, and so just imagine what we can do. Actually, and you don't have to, because I'll help us imagine as we go along. That's actually what I'm talking about. Running out of time, running out of time, okay. So, who am I? Um, I was interested through retinitis pigmentosa running in my family, and um, colorblindness as well, just this idea of our bodies um, as being a conduit for our experience for life, and how that could really change depending on um, just our genes, right? And so, um, speaking of artwork, the, the motivation for my current research, which is in tissue engineering and regenerative medicine, is this idea of the fountain of youth, right? So you see all these people kind of decrepit coming in on the left, and they get into this fountainous water, and then they get out on the right rejuvenated and young, right? And so this is the idea of tissue engineering. So I'm a tissue engineer. Um, is to um, grow spare parts for the human body to help us extend our lives. Okay. Now, what are the implications of that? Um, I specifically work on the heart. <laughs> I work on the heart, right? And as we know, cardiovascular disease kills more people than all cancer combined. And as the world ages and the population globalizes, the, the implications are only going to continue to grow. And um, we don't really have any cure for heart disease besides organ donation. And we just don't have enough organ donors. And so the motivation for our field is to 
you know, try and circumvent that. What if we can grow an organ? What if we can have organ donation without an organ donor? So this is the idea. And um, as we've learned before, cells are the building blocks of every part of our body, right? So I had to learn about these cells. Like, how the hell do you grow them? Um, and, and so it turns out that if you, keep, if you take some cells, keep them sterile, keep them moist, and give them food, many kinds of cells can be grown in labs and incubators. Okay. But getting them to form more complex tissues, much harder. And so we have to kind of do a little bit of market research and find out from the cells um, what they need. Um, and in terms of the heart, there's a couple things, it turns out, that are really important to heart cells. What are those things? Well, heart cells, you might guess, being that our heart beats billions of times in a lifetime, three billion times, crazy. Um, that maybe they're metabolically active? They are. They're the most metabolically active cells in our body. They are super, they're beating, you know, rhythmically, tirelessly, um, usually in spite of everything that we do to ourselves, right? Um, and so we mimic that in the lab by outfitting cell culture systems with electrodes. I'm an electrical engineer. This is how I got into this. Um, what else do we know about the heart? Well, they're pretty greedy, right? It must be, take a lot of energy to, to do all the, that beating. And so um, what we do in the lab, I mean, what, we, what, the, what nature does, actually, is that um, there's a very dense capillary bed. So all these heart cells are really next to their food and next to their oxygen supplies, and they're very well fed. Um, and so in the lab, we copy that by outfitting the scaffolds on which we grow these tissues with, um, with kind of fake capillaries. So we laser pierce all these like, biomaterials and, um, and flow the food through them and build lots of contraptions with like, flow and electrical stuff to get this to happen. I'll show you some pictures a little later. Um, and we try and copy this, right? Because the cells, if we can trick them into thinking they're inside the body in the lab, we can get them to do all the same amazing things, if not more, than what they are doing in our bodies. Okay. So, here's an example. Oh, no sound, please. Thank you. This is a piece of tissue that I engineered in the lab. It's about the size of a mini marshmallow. And as you can see, it's beating. Um, it's beating um, as I'm pacing it. If you guys ever want to visit me in the lab, look me up in New York. I'll let you turn the dial. If you turn up the dial, it'll start beating faster. Turn it down, it'll beat slower. And sometimes, you know, we um, joke around and we put music on. Um, a, a Sorry for another time. Um, and um, so these cells, they respond, by the way, as an electrical engineer, to build a piece of equipment that the cells can actually respond to. Totally mind-blowing, even now, years later. Um, so where are we going with this? And I've only got a couple minutes left, right? So my colleagues, this is my colleague Warren's work. He's building pieces of bone. That's a piece of a TMJ um, in, in, in your um, jaw, right? And so if you, can, if you can build implants for people that are made for them, how amazing would that be? Okay. Um, there are lots of us. So as at tissue engineers, we have a bit of an identity crisis because we're building all these enabling technologies that actually the cells are doing everything. But um, what really is happening is that all us PhD students and postdocs and everybody around the world who are building these contraptions, there's a lot of operator dependence and not a whole lot of modularity. So how do we scale this up? This is where the field is going now. And this is a picture, a schematic of a plug and play modular bioreactor that we're designing right now. Um, and one of my students, Adrian, who's amazing, I love you, Adrian, is actually like building an app on an Android, not an iPhone. She's got her, you can talk to her about that, um, to be able to control these things. So, so technologies are all feeding each other, you know? This is a really exciting time. Okay, so we can imagine, now this is a schematic, this is not real, okay? Um, this is, imagine being able to print using 3D printing technologies and combining that with what we're doing to be able to build customized tissues, customized organs for you, for me, for everyone. Um, this is um, hopefully where the field could be going, organ donation without organ donors. Um, now, what about making that really small, okay? What if, okay, so you know how much, anyone know how much it costs to develop a drug? Over a billion dollars, that's insane. Why? Most drugs fail really close to the end of their clinical trials. Why? Two things, okay, and they're pretty obvious. One, we are not rats. <laughs> I mean, I live in New York, right? Like, I, we have a war going on with rats every day. Um, there's a great book called Rats, totally recommend it. And we're not rats, so if we're testing stuff in rats before we put it in people, there are going to be some surprises. <laughs> Secondly, Anyone wonder, like, oh, 99%, we're like chimpanzees, but totally we're not chimps, right? Now, the, now the, thing, the same thing happens with people. We have so much in common with each other, right? And it's beautiful. 99.999999% of who we are is the same. 
But it turns out that tiny, tiny differences make a huge difference in how we respond to drugs. That's why we have clinical trials. Okay, so we are not animals, and we are also not each other. We have incredible diversity, and those two things put together are a huge reason why we have idiosyncratic drug failure really close to the end of clinical trials. So what if we can make a clinical trial on a chip? What if we can take your cells, find out how your body's gonna react to a drug? Find out how a thousand people's bodies are gonna react to a drug? That's cool. That's where we're moving right now. Okay, what if, okay, we grew a little piece of heart, a little piece of liver, a little piece of bone, put them all on the same chip? Then we can really find out some, and tease out some of this complexity that happens in the body, right? Because we know that nothing acts in isolation. That's where this field is going to. Okay, disease models on a chip, like what Kevin Egan's doing with ALS. We can transform the drug discovery process, to transform um, drug testing, um, transform individual, into individualized medicine, um, and, and save so many costs along the way. Forget about the fact that it can reduce animal testing and human testing. Okay. There's some crazy stuff that potentially we could do too. So um, electric eels. All right, what if you took the electric, um, electrocytes within electric eels, they make like 600 volts, okay? What if you made a battery out of their cells? Wouldn't that be cool? No one's doing that, but that's a picture that someone proposed. Okay, what if, <laughs> what if you could grow, what if you could make a hamburger that never involved growing grass to feed your food so that you could make your food out of it? Okay, what if, what if you could grow a leather jacket in the that's a group from Australia. By the way, that's mouse leather, okay? Meaning they grew leather out of like cancer cells from a mouse from like the 1970s. Like, wrap your head around that. Um, okay, so people ask me, people are constantly asking me, that little beating piece of heart tissue, when is that gonna go into a person? And I say, or, you know, when are any of these technologies gonna hit the, hit the world? And I say, look, I don't know. I don't know, there's lower hanging fruit, there's higher hanging fruit. And um, you might be asking, what cell type is that? Actually, if you type in Google, valley of death, that's what pops up. That's what one of the first images. And you're like, what do any of you guys know what I mean when I say the valley of death? No. So the valley of death is a term that um, us academics and some people in venture capital use to describe this gap in feasibil feasibility and funding between what the NIH and NSF and other government bodies fund in terms of basic science and what a venture capitalist or angel investor would be comfortable with funding. And that gap is a little bit big now. And it has implications not only for the technology that's gonna be hitting the world, but also on how we think about innovation in nanotech, energy sector, and beyond. So to try and prepare myself for some of this, because as we know, we are nature and nurture, we are DNA and environmental factors, right? This is what I've learned from the cells. Um, I enrolled in business school. So I'm trying to figure out how to do this better. And I would welcome your ideas on how to do it better Again, over drinks. Um, also forgot my business card, sorry. Um, but I want, that's not the thought I wanted to finish with today. I really wanted to finish with kind of a personal, um, a personal um, mandate that I like to, to have for myself. Like, I wanna share with you what I've learned from the cells um, for my own life. And um, one of them is to kind of channel my inner stem cell. And I invite you to do the same. Um, and to think, you're laughing. Just think, how can I incorporate um, my, how can I think about my choices when I think about self-renewal and creativity in my own life, okay? And then secondly, to think, just like all these cells, I often feel quite small. And even if I felt big, I actually am quite small. And no matter how big or small we feel we are, we actually are quite small. Um, but we all have our role to play. And so I, I just invite all of you to kind of channel your inner stem cell. Thank you so much. <laughs>